Beautiful. Oh, what's up? I'm just putting these puddings in the oven. I've sprinkled brown sugar on top, and now I'm going to caramelize the top under the broiler. Yeah, but you could use a blowtorch for that. I beg your pardon? A blowtorch is great for doing the job. It gives you even control over the burn, and when using gas, it gives you good control over the heat. <laughs> that may be so, Mr. Watson, but I do not own a blowtorch, because I am not a plumber. Oh, heavens forbid, heavens forbid. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, nothing at all, nothing at all. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of One Chef, One Critic. I'm Carl Wells, food critic for The Telegraph. And I'm Chef Steve Watson of Central Dairies. Steve, a gas really is preferred by most chefs. I know we have electric in this kitchen, uh, but a lot of chefs swear by gas because it does control the heat. Again, Carl, it's all about controlling the heat. And look at this uh, gas stove here. It's either on or you can reduce it down very, very slowly, like so. It's instant. Uh, it's instant. Mm -hmm. And if with the electric, when you turn that on and turn it down, it takes its time to cool down, you see. So, yes, it is preferred by all chefs. Now, another new innovation is induction cooking. And we have an induction range here, which came from Big Eric's. And the way this works is uh, this plate, which does not get hot, by the way. It's very interesting. It works kind of like a microwave. It speeds up the molecules in the pot, uh, causing them to get really hot. And so that's how uh, this one works. And again, total control. Good total control. Set on it on 300, yeah. and then you can bring it back to 200, and it's instant. instant. It's instant. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is a great uh, new innovation. Absolutely. Uh, coming up on the program today, we have as our guest Jeremy Bennett. Jeremy is uh, a guy who uh, really believes in the power of the human mind. Uh, and it's, it's an amazing uh, topic, really. Uh, we're going to hear from him. And what are we going to be cooking with? Chicken piccata. Oh, a little bit of spice today. Yes. And we have Andrea Monder of Bacalao who's going to show us how to make pastry, which is easier than you think. Stick around. For a complete listing of One Chef, One Critic recipes, wine lists, and more, check out our website. Let us know what you think of the show at 757-9600 or send us an email at onechef.onecritic at rci.rogers.com. And we've been joined by Jeremy Bennett. And uh, Jeremy, um, it's nice to have such a positive guy <laughs> on the show, you know, to cancel out the negativity between this guy and me. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's none of that, is there, Carl? Huh? There's none of that, is there? Negativity? <laughs> no. It's a tinge. <laughs> what are we going to be making today, uh, Steve? Actually, we're going to be making a chicken piccata. And, uh, but I'm combining it with maybe a little chicken picante. I'm going to put a little bit of spice and uh, herbs in that into our dredging of the flour. And we're going to be cooking that with some capers and some lemons as well. So awesome. let's well, get started. Awesome. Sounds Sounds great. Great. What am I going to be doing for you? Carl, we've got the grill on there again. And what I'd like you to do is grill some nice sweet potatoes with some salt and pepper and oil, Ooh, so to speak. So. I love sweet potatoes. Yeah, okay. so. same here. Yeah. One of my favorite things to eat, actually. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just put a little bit of cayenne into our flour. And Jeremy, I'll get you to put a little bit of oil into the frying pan there yep. for us as well. About half of that, that's fine. No, maybe about a quarter of that, sorry. That's a little bit too much. And some chili peppers there as well. I better get these on because it might take a while for these two. They will do, yes, Cal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we Jeremy, uh, you, you kind of first came to prominence because of your book, which was about uh, your uh, struggles with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? OCD, as it's known. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what, what are... What are there are a lot of people out there, you know, who actually may have OCD and who don't realize that they have it. So what, what are the symptoms of OCD? OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder and basically what it is, it's a way of controlling your environment around you yeah. with something called compulsions because you can't really control what's in your head, what's in your mind. So a lot of people, if they pick up a glass of water They'll have to pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down, until their mind feels right, until their body feels right. So it's kind of a way of controlling things around you mm -hmm. 
because you can't really control the obsessions in your head. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Newfoundlanders alone, a lot of people are suffering with anxiety and depression. And since I released the book in 2010, I had no idea myself how many people were suffering with it until I started to get the phone calls, I started to get the emails, and I started to get people actually reaching out to me at my presentations. Right. But it's yeah. something um, that's affecting so many people worldwide, but especially here in our province. There's, there's no doubt about that. The, the other thing about uh, OCD is that it usually begins to affect people. Its onset is when people are fairly young, in their yeah. teens. Eh? Yeah, exactly. Is that what happened to you? Yeah, I, I was experiencing symptoms at about the age of 12. And I went from age 12 to about age 18 absolutely not having a clue what obsessive compulsive disorder was until I was formally diagnosed with OCD in my grade 12. So okay. up until then, I was doing all these rituals, having all these obsessions, doing all these compulsions, I mean like four to six hours a day, and I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. And it wasn't until age 18 or 19 that I was formally diagnosed and, uh, you know, took the steps that I needed to get over what I was going so through. So what, what would a cons compulsion be? Tr uh, maybe checking to make sure the iron is off? Uh, yeah. Instead of checking once, checking 20 times? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's anything that you do physically that calms your mind. So, for instance, if I uh, picked up uh, my cell phone, and I get this obsession in my mind of something I didn't want to see, something I didn't right. want to visualize, I'd have to pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down, pick it up, right. put it down, over and over and over again until my mind felt rested. Rest. I would um, always count everything around me. I walk into a room, I count all the people, I count all the chairs, I count everything around me, the tiles on the floor. I would go through green lights and look up and down, look up and down, look up and down, look up and down. Anything that rested my mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't until, like I said, around age 18, I was formally diagnosed, didn't have a clue what it was prior to that, and, you know, lived a life in more or less torment mm -hmm. back then for about eight to ten years, mm -hmm. not having a clue what it was. But one of the, you know, the most beneficial things I've done was to reach out for help with something that I was extremely hesitant to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I eventually did it, one of the most important things well, I did. I think the thing is a lot of people uh, who, who suffer from that kind of um, a disorder are kind of embarrassed by it. And they don't want people to think, geez, he's, he's crazy, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. It's, they're afraid of the stigma that might be attached to them because of that. Right? Absolutely. The stigma is huge. We worked on a 2011 national anti-stigma campaign for mental health. Uh, a couple of years back, and I mean, we, we've seen it firsthand how large this stigma is. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you break your arm, you go to the doctor the next day, there's a cast on it. Nobody's scared to do that. But when dealing with something invisible in the mind, that stigma is just, it's, it's, it's huge. But the good news is, it's decreasing. Day by day, year by year, it's That's actually right. decreasing. Okay. More and more people are talking about it, which is a, a phenomenal sign. Now, can we just recap, Steve? Okay, what we've done, we dredge it in the flour with our spices, and uh, we're, we're cooking that in with a little bit of olive oil and some flour. Uh, sorry, and some butter. Actually, we'll start to turn them now, uh, Jeremy, if you yeah. wish. We'll turn them over. And what we're going to do, once they're cooked, we're going to add some lemons, which I've just diced up, some capers, and a little bit of chopped parsley as well. So, so it's starting uh, to look good. Yeah, How it looks delicious. How does come into play with your... Uh... Uh, you know, more and more people are becoming aware that uh, a lot of the time we're not eating food anymore. We're eating food-like products synthesized yes. in a laboratory full of chemicals. Yes, yes. A lot more people are becoming aware that organic food, real food, one ingredient food is the way to go. And the effect that this has on the brain in terms of attracting anxiety and depression is huge. It's, it's huge. Okay. But we are living in a world now that is becoming more aware of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the last 10, 20 years we've seen, um, for instance, if you look on a soda can, you would see 10 years ago sugar-free. A lot of people are not noticing that anymore. We're seeing aspartame free. free. So we're starting to realize sugar is better than aspartame <laughs> in moderation. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on what we're noticing. So, I mean, one ingredient foods, real food is the way to go for anxiety and depression. And it actually helps. helps. It helps calm yeah. the body. Yeah. We're not fill, filling it full of chemicals synthesized in a laboratory. So, I mean, back to the basics. Yeah. This is what it is. So food. Uh, now what about the supernatural life? Here that you're involved with the supernatural a little bit, or are you? Yeah. Is it a hobby yeah. for you? Or? It's, uh, well, I investigated professionally for a few years as one of my biggest passions, investigating the mind in terms of what's happening uh, to people who claim to experience something supernatural. Yeah. So we filmed throughout the United States, throughout some places in Canada, 
and uh, throughout the UK investigating a subject called chaos magic, which is basically the belief that the mind can alter reality. So during those shows, I investigated exorcisms, possession. They actually had me take part in a real life yeah, possession. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't possessed, but I was in the room investigating it. Yeah, so yeah. that was kind of a that was a, an interesting experience. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I was kind of wary of what, what was actually going on. So everything from UFOs to crop circles, extraterrestrial life. So you could go to the UK death. and you go to the summer solstice. Yeah, well, edge. hopefully, uh, uh, we didn't do that yet, no, but no. I'd love to go there. And yeah. I know you have an interest in it yeah, as well. Absolutely. Like, I'd yeah, absolutely yeah. love to go there. It's a yeah. UFO hotspot. Yeah. So uh, anything from, you know, possession to UFOs, mm -hmm. extraterrestrial life, mm -hmm. life after death. I'm yeah. investigating um, a case in the UK now about life after death where the Society of Psychical Research investigated this phenomena for five years, all coming back saying, you know, we don't know how this is done, and they're kind of leaning towards the side of, this is legitimate. Mm -hmm. So that kind of yeah. sparked my interest. But uh, I am very skeptical, but very open-minded at the same time. Good, but yeah. I like to analyze the minds of the people who claim mm -hmm. to have experienced something supernatural to see what's actually going on inside of their minds. Mm -hmm. And even though I am very skeptical, I'm extremely open-minded. And I mean, the reality is nobody can debate this. We live in a very mysterious world, <laughs> very mysterious world. And we don't have explanations yeah. for every little thing. So it's... Uh, but always, always one of my biggest interests. Perfect. Well, it is mysterious because, <laughs> you know, it goes right back to the question of uh, who are we, where did we come from, yeah. why are we here? Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. <laughs> anyway, uh, before we get into too heavy a conversation, <laughs> I'm going to yeah. go down to the wine cellar and uh, talk with one of our wine, yeah. wine experts about what would go with chicken piccata. Uh, and I will be back. Sounds Perfect. great. Thanks a lot, See you soon. So our chicken's almost done now. We'll just yep. add some... Capers to that. Looks delicious. And then we'll add a few lemons. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also going to add a little bit of chicken stock in there as well. I mean, just, just let that reduce a little bit. Yep. And then that's it. We'll put some awesome. parsley on it and away we go. Sounds fantastic. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Hi, Greg. Hey, Carl. How are you doing? Well, great. Uh, we've got chicken piccata today. It's a little bit spicy, slightly tart, not too creamy, not too rich, a very healthy dish, actually. So uh, what do you recommend today with our chicken piccata? Well, I think if, you're, if you've got something spicy, you, you don't want too much acid because the acid will enhance the spice. And of course, chicken, you don't want to overwhelm it with anything too tannic. So I think that we have three wines here, all from California, oh. that will probably do okay. So the first wine is uh, called Four Vines Naked Chardonnay. It's from Santa Barbara, so Southern California. Nice hot climate. Uh, it's called Naked Chardonnay because there's no oak on this. So really the, the idea is to accentuate the, the tropical fruit. The acid is not too high, but I think the wine is, is nice and clean and direct. And I think it'll, it'll do just fine with your chicken. Yeah, I'm, not too, I'm not too crazy about really oaky Chardonnay, so I would probably like that one. I think it's a good choice. And again, for $21, it's, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, that's a good price. Uh, the second wine is called Duckhorn Vineyard uh, Sauvignon Blanc. This is also California, and it's from the Napa Valley. And these guys are actually world famous for their Sauvignon Blanc. Mm. And again, it's a hotter climate, so Sauvignon Blanc, the acid is not too high. It has beautiful citrus flavors, mm -hmm. and it's rounded out with a bit of Semillon as well. Um, again, $33. World famous, uh, I don't think you could go wrong here. Yeah, it's a great, great, uh, great winery. And finally, if you're feeling some red wine, I have some Pinot Noir here, Carl. And knowing you, I, I think this might be the choice. Uh, Bliss Family Vineyards is family owned operation in Mendocino, so just north of Napa, Sonoma. Uh, fairly simple Pinot Noir here, you know, the traditional cherry, strawberry, raspberry. The tannins are soft, and I think it'll also work with your chicken. And how much is that one? This comes in at about $24. Okay. I love the name. I, I mean, I guess that's the family name, Bliss, is that it? That is yeah. the family name. Yeah. That's a good name for well, wine as well. Hopefully it will we'll <laughs> put me in a blissful mood because uh, I'm in the mood for uh, red wine and uh, our guest is actually a teetotaler, so we're going to... Okay. Uh, I've, got, uh, I've got my pick of the crop today. So thank you very much, uh, Greg. Okay, Carl. Uh, Bliss Pinot Noir. Excellent. Enjoy. Thank you. We'll just add our sauce to that now, our capers, our lemons, and parsley. A little bit of chicken stock there with a with a beautiful sweet potatoes. And uh, maybe we'll just go and see Carl and Jeremy in the dining room. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the supernatural. Okay, Jeremy, we have a very good vintage sparkling water <laughs> for you. 
Sounds fantastic. Now, let's have a taste. Mm -hmm. It looks delicious. It does look delicious, yeah. And you've got capers on top, Steve. Yeah, with the parsley and the lemon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. That tastes very mm. good. Mm -hmm. It's tender, Carl. That's what it is. It's tangy. Yep. Yep. Absolutely delicious. Yep. Yep. Delicious. Yep. Yeah, I like that tanginess. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Jeremy, I want to get back to the, uh, the OCD. Now, I know for a lot of people who have OCD, uh, medication has been a great solution for them. But in your case, it didn't work, right? Well, with me, I would never, you know, kind of downgrade medication. It, it's needed for a lot of people. With me, it just didn't do the trick. Um, what a lot of people have to realize when dealing with any kind of mental illness is that medication is not going to address the cause. No. It's kind of like taking a Tylenol for a headache. You don't have a headache because you have a Tylenol deficiency. Same with OCD and same with any kind of mental illness. So now I never do, you know, kind of downgrade medication at all. But, um, you know, I kind of talk about treating the cause as opposed to the symptom, getting to the root of the cause. And until people so do that... So what might the cause be, though? Um, I mean, it, it could be a variety of factors. Sometimes it's childhood trauma. It could be something that we're repressed. It's something we don't even know about, something that we're actually repressing from childhood. Mm -hmm. But it could be accumulated stress from financial strain, from relationship strain, from strain with the kids, with our children, whatever it may be. So were you able to identify a root cause in your case? Um, I'm still investigating that. Okay. Um, yeah. I investigated it a lot about five or six years ago. I'm not completely sure what caused it, but uh, I'm on the road to discovering Because there that. are people who would disagree with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you must realize that. I mean, yeah. there, are, there are, you know, scientists, for example, who would say uh, OCD is caused by uh, your brain not uh, making enough serotonin or yeah. I, I'm, yeah. it's a chemical imbalance in the brain yeah. and the medication will offset that. You're, yes. you're yeah. saying that it's not an imbalance, no, chemical no, imbalance? No, or no definitely not saying that. No, absolutely not. It's basically environmental factors have a huge impact on our mental health, physical health. There's, there's no doubt about that. But in terms of what we do daily, like, I mean, there's no doubt there's chemical imbalances, but what causes those chemical imbalances is the thing. So, and I mean, everything from what we eat to what mm -hmm. we're exposed to, mm -hmm. what we watch on television, what we're bombarding our subconscious minds with, that all has an effect on our mental health. So, I mean, medication does the trick for a lot of people, and it's extremely beneficial. Uh, for me, unfortunately, it wasn't. Yeah. But, uh, and I kind of took another route. But, I mean, one of the main factors that we can do with experiencing any kind of stress any kind of anxiety or depression is sit down and talk to the people that know about this, the yeah. professionals, the doctors, psychiatrists, the counselors, the people who specialize in this. And for the most part, a lot of us are not doing that, which right. is kind of yeah. sad because of the stigma. But, uh, I mean, the biggest piece of advice I can give people is talk about it. Talk, mm -hmm. sit down to a professional who mm -hmm. really knows this stuff mm -hmm. and uh, get it off their chest, if nothing else. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, Jeremy, it's been great having you on the show, and I just want to show uh, a couple of things mm -hmm. that are available uh, that you've authored. One is this CD, mm -hmm. which is called The Astonishing Power of Your Mind, mm -hmm. and then there's the book, which uh, you've probably seen at chapters in many bookstores. Uh, it's basically uh, How I Beat OCD by Jeremy Bennett, and if you go to Jeremy's Facebook page, I'm sure you'll find out uh, how to... Uh, find these and find out what yeah. this guy's up to. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for being on the show. It's been fantastic uh, being here. Thank you so slice. much. And we'll be back with Andrea Maunder, who's going to show us how to make pastry the easy way. Stay tuned. You've seen the show and now there's a book. Cooking with One Chef, One Critic by Carl Wells with Steve Watson features 120 recipes, more than 200 photos, and plenty of behind-the-scenes stories from this long-running series. Cooking with One Chef, One Critic is available now. Well, Bacalao Newfoundland Nouvelle Cuisine continues to impress with its savory dishes made from fresh local ingredients, but we must also applaud the restaurant's sweet side <laughs> and all of those wondrous, irresistible desserts. 
And the person who creates those desserts is with us now, Andrea Monder. Hi, Carl. How are you? Hi, Steve. Good. How are Perfect. You? Great. So, what, uh, what irresistible delight are you going to make for us? Well, we're going to demystify pastry this morning. I oh, know people good. quake in their boots when they think about pie crust. They get all scared. That's true. And including really. myself. <laughs> including you know, myself. a lot of savory chefs really don't like to do pastry. No, no, indeed we don't. Yeah, That's our three for sure. guys at the restaurant, they really don't. Yeah. They really don't. So, what we're going to do is uh, start, I have a food processor method that really takes the mystery out of it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go from there. So, so I what have, do we have two cups of flour. This okay. is just regular all-purpose mm -hmm. flour. Okay. And there was a time when not many people owned food processors, but I venture to guess now they're as common as toasters. I would think probably pretty yeah. much everybody has a food yeah. processor now. So I have cubed one cup of spyglass butter, so okay. that's half a pound, mm -hmm. and it just kind of makes it a little easier to start the processing. And this is icy cold. We just took this out of the refrigerator, and that's important. So it's key to have everything cold. It is, it is yeah. yeah. And we have ice water there as well. I just fished the ice out just before we turned the cameras on so that I wouldn't get ice falling in my food processor, but mm -hmm. there's So you've got uh, butter and margarine. There. I do, exactly. Okay. And I prefer that. Um, I, I like the flavor of the butter, mm -hmm. but I like the way that the margarine performs better the in blends. the pastry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Pastry doesn't tend to brown quite as quickly, and you just get a little bit more. Um, the texture, I find, is just a little bit better. Right. So I'm just going to put this on. I didn't, uh, I've never heard of mixing margarine and butter before. <laughs> yeah, like I like it. I was doing all butter, and yeah. then I started to do some people do lard, and I find that's just a little bit too soft. Uh -huh. So I do, I love, and this is Central Dairy's margarine as well. Oh, very I mean, good. Yep, you know Perfect. it. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll I like, keep you up. I like the texture of yeah. that. So what we're going to do is just pulse to get this going. So that's all blending in there. Exactly, well. just yeah. a little bit. So we're just yeah. breaking it up a little bit. Yeah. And what I'm going to do now is just pour in as I pulse. You need to be a little bit ambidextrous here, but you just keep pulsing. The ice cold water into exactly. the Exactly, yeah. I see. And I have two little nieces who are five and six who come and help me, and they like to do the pulsing. I see. And now that they're five and six, they actually do stop and start when I ask them. It didn't used to work out that way in the beginning. Oh, okay. <laughs> they like the sound. They do, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they like to mess up their auntie, too. Yeah. So yeah. you can see that's just coming together there. Oh, yeah, yeah, very well. So you would dump that out on a board Looks and start. Looks like scrambled eggs, doesn't it? Pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, but as you can see, guys, it's still nice and cold. Cold, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? And that's perfect important. to work with, yeah. Exactly. So we're just going to move the food processor, Steve, down out of the way. I can do that. And clear this stuff right here. Mm -hmm. So I have a swap out, the magic of TV and all that. Yep. Yes. So rather than trying to take the time to pull that together. So the best thing with pastry is if you do give it chill time. So if you, from this state, this makes two pie crusts, this yep. recipe. So what you want to do is roll that out into a disc about this size mm -hmm. and refrigerate. And I don't know if you can see there, guys. You see all the butter and the margarine marbled in there, yes. Little chunks. Yeah, I can and see that's it, yeah. what makes the beautiful flaky pastry. Oh, really yeah. Awesome. So I'm just going to flour that a little bit. And I have a great Teflon rolling pin. Now, the secret with rolling pastry is you want to keep moving it around. Yeah. And, and you want to. Exactly. And you want to roll from the middle. So you see I'm keeping my round shape. Yep. And you just keep going. And by moving it like that, you're making sure it's not sticking, but it also gives That's me all, a chance yeah. to check my, my thickness as I'm going so that I'm getting a nice even roll. Now that's Perfect. not the first time she's done that. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Those savory yeah. chefs, you know. Yeah. There we are, so we'll just keep going. And then I'll show you how to fit it in the pie crust. And everybody gets scared about that part too. Okay. Fit it in the pie plate, I should say. Here we yeah. go. So you just fold it in half. There you go. I'll just pop it straight Put it in. right in the middle. And we have one we do. all ready to go here. So Look I'll pass this. you over yours. Now this is a chocolate silk pie. Yeah, And perfect. we'll put this recipe on the website. This has a little bit of the brand new iceberg infusions uh, chocolate mint vodka in it. Oh, mm. very good. Which is baked out, so this would even be suitable for kids. We don't need to worry about that. Oh, really good. Delicious. So it's really yep. nice. And so what I do is I just go around and then... Crimp it in. Just crimp it in like that. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. My pleasure. Another triumph. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for this edition of... One Chef. One Credit. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andre. You've taken all the myth out of that for me. <laughs> nice breakfast. Yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of vodka in there too. Mm.